Hey, as you're being seated this morning, what a great day to be in the house of the Lord. I am very excited about this new series that we're kicking off this morning and uh, just what God's doing. I just feel like there's a, there's a new thing that's happening, and so uh, we're excited to be a part of that. One thing I do want to uh, mention before we jump into the Word this morning is uh, if you're here with us this morning for the very first time, uh, this is your first time at River of Life. We want to welcome you, we want you really to feel a part and a connection and uh, beyond just being in a service with us. And so if this is your first time with us, if you just lift your hand, let us know who you are, all of our first timers this morning. God bless you. Let's give them a hand. Amen. And if you would fill out that little uh, section there in your bulletin, you can go ahead and tear that off. And uh, all of our first timers take it to... The Fresh Start booth right outside the door here, and we have a gift for you for being our guest uh, this morning. Always great to have you with us. All right, everybody say, The Ripple Effect. That's the title of our new series. We're going to be focused for the next uh, probably six weeks in the short little, actually it was a handwritten note that was preserved for us, that become part of scripture, that was now handed down to us. And uh, little did Paul know when he penned this note uh, with a quill in his own handwriting there shackled while he was a prisoner for the sake of the Lord. Little did he know that this note to a friend asking for a tremendous favor would, would bring radical social change. And neither did he realize at the time <laughs> that it would be uh, on par with the, the, the scriptures that he so fiercely defended in the Old Testament as a Pharisee of Pharisees and persecuted people who were uh, followers of this new thing called the way. And, and so this thing called the ripple effect, say that again, would you please? The ripple effect. It is, it's, everybody's done it, I believe, at one time or another. You've either splashed in a puddle and, and watched the ripples go back and forth, or you've taken a rock and thrown it into a pond, and, and you see the concentric circles that go out, but they don't just stop there. They, they bounce off the edges, and then they come back in. And if you watch it, it goes out and in and out and in. And so the principle here is everything we do in response to God, creates a ripple effect. That it affects not only our lives, but those closest to us. And then in concentric circles out past that, it affects other people's lives. And here, thousands of years later, one handwritten note asking Philemon for a favor, a personal favor, And tucked in there is some funny things, some deep humor. Paul writes and he says, listen, I want you to receive Onesimus back. And we'll explain all this in a moment, but I just, I love this line. And he says, if he's wronged you or if he owes you anything, put it on my account. I will pay it. And I'm writing this with my own hand. Basically, Paul was writing an IOU writing a blank check here put his stuff on my account I'll I'll take responsibility and then he adds this little line not to mention that you owe me your very life I just find that funny don't you how many of you know if you're going to call in a favor you need to know that somebody owes you a favor but here's the thing I love about it Paul doesn't demand that Philemon do this because he's a leader Because there's a church that meets in his house. He doesn't demand that he do it because of Paul's position or authority. He doesn't even demand that he do it out of guilt. That that not only is it the right thing to do, but Onesimus may have wronged you, but he helped me. And so, do it for me if you can't do it for him. Doesn't play any of those games. He plays it straight up with a heart of love. And he makes his appeal based in love. And here's the powerful thing that I know, the truth that has become real, that in the ripple effect, if you're going to start a ripple, sometimes the ripple kind of fizzles out. But the Bible says love never fails. So Paul didn't drop the hammer in Philemon's life, so to speak. He dropped the rock, Christ Jesus. And he dropped love in the note. And he said, listen, 
this is not a demand, this is a request, this is a personal favor, and I appeal to you with a heart of love. My love for this young man who's wronged you, who left you, who betrayed you, and probably stole from you. The, the kid who ripped you off that you gave up on, I'm appealing for him, and, and not only that, but I'm appealing to you to receive him back again. And when he finished the note, he didn't send it with a courier. He didn't send it with somebody else. He looked Onesimus in the eye and handed it to him. And he said, take this note back to Philemon and deliver it to him yourself. Ever had a God moment? Ever had an aha time? Ever answered the door? And there stood someone that you didn't know what to say or how to say it? Ever got the phone call that you were or were not expecting, but all of a sudden God was in it? The, the, the awkward relationship that had been strained or stressed or broken and now is the first step to patch it back up? What do we do? The ripples not only go out, but the ripples come back. The Bible calls it sowing and reaping. And Galatians says, Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. It says, don't be deceived. God's not mocked. For, for God to, to not handle truth or justice or allow the, the ripples in our life to, to only be the good things that we do and not the bad things. That, that they, they do come back to us. But here, Paul intercepts the ripple effect, and it was a negative ripple. It was more of a spiritual tsunami that was coming back toward Onesimus, and he was caught. He was wrong, but Paul saw in his life something that nobody else saw, and he intercepted the ripples, and he started another one. He dropped another rock in the pond, and he started a bigger ripple going out than the one that was coming back. Are you with me? I believe that God wants to drop another rock in our lives this morning. I believe that God wants to drop another rock in uh, this pond, this pool uh, called our city and our area and Hattiesburg and the surrounding area. And I think God wants to start another ripple. Indeed, God wants to start a wave. That, that God wants us to be those who make waves in the right way. The enemy is working uh, over time. And there's all kinds of ripples going back and forth of suspicion and intrigue and social dynamics and everything else in our city. We can choose to either make a difference, to ride the waves of our culture and social change, to have our boat rocked a little bit and kind of go through that process, or we can choose to make a bigger wave that's going to intercept and overcome those other waves and change and influence the area around us. Everybody say ripple effect. Okay, that you start ripples by your actions and any response, even the smallest one, it, it done in response toward God creates a ripple effect. It, here, here's how it happens in a very small way. Let me illustrate. By the way, if you can turn to the, uh, the little letter uh, or the book we call it of Philemon. It's not a book, it's a personal note. If you go to Titus, right after Timothy, and there's one little page, basically three quarters of a page, depending on if you got one of those uh, old folks' large print Bibles, it might be a page and a half, but it's not very long. If you got one of them youth Bibles, it's probably just a little paragraph. 25 verses. Lines, basically. They weren't verses when Paul wrote them. 25 expressions of his heart. In the power of the Spirit. So uh, if you can't find it, go to Hebrews and take a left. There you go. Right, right, right between Titus and Hebrews is the little note, the letter called Philemon. Everybody say Philemon. All right, now while you're turning there, listen to me. 26 years ago, Kim was sitting with a friend of ours in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and she was talking about um, her experience on the mission field and a certain type of soda that she liked. 
and that she really missed having that soda and she just wished that she could have another bottle or can of that soda just in a conversation at a table. I don't remember all the dynamics, but there's a point to the story. Everybody say ripple effect. Okay? And so here's Kim. She listens to that conversation, and they had some brief exchange. And Cindy's birthday, her friend, was coming up in a few days. And so Kim went and found the soda and gave it to her as a birthday present. 26 years ago, soda. I know, you health food people, do the, do the equation there. Let forgiveness happen in your heart. But, so, so my point is what? That, that's a pretty insignificant thing for somebody to even remember. Can you remember what you got for your birthday 26 years ago? Anybody? Anybody, anybody? Most of us not. Unless it was huge, unless it was monumental. Friday night, we were sitting at home, and uh, our Emily's 30th birthday, our daughter, was the next day, and, and uh, some, some, we were reading through some Facebook things and, and just talking as we were sharing, and Kim's friend Cindy posted on our daughter Emily's Facebook page that incident and said, your parents, your mom especially, was so thoughtful that years ago, when I mentioned about this can of soda that I had on the mission field, your mom went and bought some for me and gave it to me for my birthday all those years ago, and I've never forgotten it. And so as we're sitting there having this wonderful conversation, Kim bursts into tears and starts crying uncontrollably. Well, that's a little overdramatic. But, but it did bring her to tears to think that someone that would remember not only that incident, but the ripple effect would come back through 26 years of time and birthdays and gifts and miles, and we haven't seen them or talked with them in person in several years. And so here's this time of her expressing to our daughter one simple act of kindness that her mother did 26 years ago. When I'm talking about the ripple effect, I'm not talking about the big things. You don't have to move boulders into a pond to create a ripple. The smallest pebble can do it. Now, obviously, the law of physics is the bigger the rock, the bigger the ripples. So, so when we take it to the level here this morning, when we're talking about the ripple effect, Paul didn't just drop a little pebble in the pond uh, to you know, Philemon's house or in the pond at Colossae, which is the city in which they lived, actually, when he says, the church that meets in your house, he wasn't talking about a little home church because they got offended and wanted to move off and do their own thing, and we're just going to have a little home church So because we don't believe in the institutionalized church. That wasn't it. When Paul was writing to Philemon, he was writing to the church at Colossae. Now, make the connection. The book of Colossians was written to these people that meet at his house. You say, well, how's that possible? Several years ago, we were on the mission field uh, down in Mexico visiting uh, Brett Hancock and some of those guys. And uh, in the, the town where they were meeting, we had about 300 people that gathered in uh, a man's house who owned a grocery store there in the town and hosted that meeting at his house. And he had a little courtyard built out around his house. Very nice by those means. But uh, it wasn't a leader. Didn't meet all the qualifications of an elder. But he opened his heart and opened his home. And the church met at his house. And it wasn't a home church. It wasn't a little uh, a small group. It, it was a, a church of several hundred people that met under this covering, this carport at his house. Everybody getting the picture here? Say ripple effect. So Paul is writing this handwritten note to Philemon, who, who uh, hosts this church in his home. He would have been wealthy. He would have been a slave owner. He was a Gentile. He was a man who opened his heart here, and Paul is writing on behalf of uh, uh, 
uh, one of the young men who used to be a slave in his household. The thing you also need to realize is slavery in Roman days was a particularly brutal form. Slavery in any way is a brutal thing. But particularly here, that they had no rights. They were not always treated even as humans. Certainly had no rights as citizens. And very few rights in the household. And so the fact that Onesimus would run away would put his life in jeopardy and would also further his disconnect with any hope of having a normal life in society, certainly in that town or city. And the fact that Paul would make a connection with him and then write and not only ask that Philemon receive him back, but he receive him back as a son and a beloved brother in the Lord, not just take him back as a slave, and Paul saying, and go light on the punishment. What he's asking him to do has never been done. What he's asking him to do is to break all the rules. What he's asking him to do is look past his heart, look past his checkbook, look past his hurt and his offense, and to look past the mistakes of a man in a difficult place and receive him back again, not as a slave, but as a beloved brother in Christ. Did you hear it? In Christ. So Paul drops Jesus in the pond. The rock, Christ Jesus. He doesn't appeal to him on his apostolic authority, and he's not just playing the God card. He said, do what's right. And I know that you know what's right. And I am so confident that you will not only do what I ask, but even more because of your love. That's powerful. So here we go. Six weeks, 25 verses. Can, is there that much material there? <laughs> Wait. Listen, if the word says every word of God is powerful every single word then, then yeah there, there's more than enough material all right it's not about the content of the material it, it's about what I feel it is is for us and so today we're going to do the introduction we're going to talk about how powerful it is when we start a ripple effect and, and how great of a ripple it, it is the fact that we even still have the note how many of you have a note that somebody wrote to you over 20 years ago you know 50 years ago, whatever. Well, here's 2,000 years ago. Okay, I'm just grateful that Philemon responded in his heart and not just did the thing, didn't just throw a fit and tear the note up. He saved it. That it was obviously that big of a deal in his life. It was a God moment. Next week, we're going to talk about those. Kairos moments. God moments. Something that stops you in your tracks. And totally changes your course. And then we're going to talk about what it means for us as a church. And then my buddy Anthony McCollum is going to come and join us. And, and we're going to talk about radical social change. And, and we're just going to create, we're going to make waves. And we're going to talk about racism. And we're going to talk about other people, those people, we people. We're going to answer questions. You're going to have an opportunity to, to send them in. We're going to take some time to sit down and just talk about what's going on in our city. Because that's what they did. What was going on in their city was friction. And, and, and Paul addressed the whole concept of slavery in such a loving way that... that it brought radical social transformation. It wasn't that he did it, it was how he did it. There is a time for us to speak up, stand up, cry out, protest, whatever. And then there's a time for us to respond to God and drop pebbles in the pond, create some waves, and leave room for God to move. Did you hear what I'm saying? 
All right, so we're going to take it on. And we're going to talk about what it means to draw people in and how God connects people and what it means to be part of a team. Because Paul didn't write it on his own. He mentioned several other people. Timothy, his son. Onesimus had become a son. Then he mentions Mark, who'd failed and left him. Demas, who'd failed and left him. Now they're connected again. Now they're part of the team. And this morning we're going to talk about those people. Because I believe in every city there are people that folks have already given up on. But God doesn't give up on us. And God wants us just to create another ripple that brings them in. And comes back to us in effectiveness even if we're the one who's made the wrong. God can make it right. And God can change lives just like He did these. And sometimes it takes us not just being the ones to make a demand or a request or deciding who's right and who's wrong, not just being a referee, being a reconciler. And you don't do that on the basis of throwing a flag and saying, you're right and you're wrong, so you need to repent, you need to forgive them. Now let's patch the thing up. Okay, group hug. Okay, everybody's good. Now this went a lot deeper than that. And so Paul appealed in love. And then he demonstrated it in such a powerful way that it changed not only their hearts and their relationship, it wasn't uh, any longer a private matter because it never had been. But Paul didn't make it a public issue without it being resolved first privately in their hearts. Everybody say, ripple effect. All right, let's look at this this morning. Here, here in uh, this note of Philemon, which I'll call it just to remind us, Paul later states here specifically, I'm writing this myself. I'm writing it in my own hand. L let's just look at a few verses here. and I want you to see from the very outset how these ripples just affect not only Philemon and Onesimus, who are the main uh, characters here, and Paul, who's the one writing the note, but it affects so many other people around them. I'll just point this out as we go along. Here it says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon. Everybody say Philemon. He says, our dear friend, not my dear friend, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier. Apphia was Philemon's wife. Archippus was his son. So it's not just about Philemon's issue. It affects Philemon. It affects Paul. It affects Timothy. It affects his family. And to the church that meets at your house. The church at Colossae. Now we've gone from just a heart issue here, an act of forgiveness, an, an act of reconciliation between two men to it affecting hundreds of people. And that hundreds of people now affect millions and millions of people who have read this down through the ages as part of Scripture itself. But I wonder how many of us have taken it and realized that when Paul started the ripple effect with a handwritten note and Philemon received it and responded in that way, did they realize that it would not only radically affect social dynamics in their day regarding slavery and the church and love and reconciliation and what it means to really walk together in relationship and forgiveness, how many one of them had the slightest clue that it would affect believers down through the generations and the ages, and that here today, several hundred more people would be hearing and responding to the Word and being affected by a ripple that came. Come on, everybody, just do this. There you go. A little ripple effect. You get it? First ripple. Paul starts the ripple. Hey, Philemon. And Philemon and Apphia and Archippus. Oh, and your family and the church that meets in your house. And hear these ripples going out one after another, after another, after another. Then he takes it on from there. Not only to the church that meets at your house, but he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see the ripple? 
Grace and peace come down from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and it comes to you. And from you, it goes to your family, and from your family, it goes to the church. And I'm part of that church. And so I'm reminding you and sending the ripple back your way, the grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he continues his words, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because... I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Come on, let's do it again. There's a ripple right there. Not just your faith, not just a private matter. You know, this is just between me and Jesus. No, it's not. And your love for all the saints. And so the ripple's going out and it's affecting people's lives. And they're watching you. And the love that you have and the faith that you have has affected their lives. And so they're going to be watching everything else you do. Not in a criticism way of taking notes and and keeping score, but the fact that when you have an influence in somebody's life, you gain a level of respect. And out of respect, you have influence. And those go together. And so then they begin to see what else is in your life. What, what are you doing? How are you raising your kids? How are you handling your marriage? How do you handle your finances? How, how are you in your business dealings in our city? Because it's not just about those things personally and those private decisions that you make. that They go public and it affects everything around you. Come on, somebody. Now let's do that. See, it's not just a little. It's big. Some things are huge. Now, if you're doing the ripple effect, don't smack your neighbor unless you realize they might need a little stronger ripple this morning. It's pastoral humor. Don't do that in the middle of the message. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus, your love for all the saints. Here's the ripple coming back. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. I love that verse. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. How many of us are really active in sharing our faith? Let let me ask it another way. How many of you have ever gone through a season in your life where you've gotten discouraged and you've forgotten All the good things Jesus did for you. They go hand in hand. Paul here is saying, the more active we are in sharing our faith, the more we constantly remember how much Jesus has done for us. How how many of us go back to that day, that, that time, and we remember people who prayed for us? We remember the the people who were kind. We remember the people that connected with us. We we remember the people that took the risk. Here's my question for you this morning. How many of you know somebody or have known somebody in your life and, and you looked at them at one point and thought, man, that person will never change. And then you saw them years later and you went, no way. Here's the next question. How many of you were that person? Let me say it this way. How many of you have ever been in a situation and you think, this, the circumstances will never change. There's no way out of this. There's no way to change it. There's no way to undo it. How many of you have ever made a mistake? Maybe like Onesimus. Committed a crime. Don't have to raise your hands on that one. Come on, think about it. Because it's that serious. Paul's not writing here because somebody got their feelings hurt. Paul's addressing the legal issue. He's addressing the spiritual issue. He's addressing the the restitution, the the repayment of a wrong. He's addressing the theft. He's addressing the, the reproach that it brings on the church, the offense that it brings to those that were involved in the process. I'm sure Onesimus had filled Paul in on his side of the argument. Here's how I was treated. Here's the deal. This is why. I, you want to know why I ran away? Here's why I ran away. You want to know why I ripped him off? Here's why I ripped him off. How many of you have ever been on that side? And the first person to present their argument, the Bible says, seems right until the other person comes forward. 
Sometimes I have to remind couples in marriage counseling or premarital counseling that, that I never wear a striped shirt while I'm doing premarital counseling because I never want to be confused with the referee. I am not the referee. I'm the pastor. And being right doesn't make you righteous. Having a flag thrown and saying you're right and you're wrong doesn't reconcile the thing. Truth will set you free. And so I always remind them, my responsibility to you is to speak the truth in love. And let freedom come. And I've had to do that a little stronger in love. And sometimes a little stronger on the truth side. And then that love kind of, come on in, everybody, come on somebody. Yeah, uh uh-huh, thank you pastor, all right. Right? And so, so here, Paul is saying how powerful it is and how effective our lives become when we send these ripples out and as we're active in sharing our faith, we're reminded of every good thing we have in Christ. How, how many of you have ever struggled with that? Of you felt like God wanted you to share Jesus with somebody and you thought, man, I'm not qualified. I, I don't know how. I don't remember. Let's see, there's Romans Road. I don't even know where Romans is in my Bible. Or... You, know, you disqualify yourself when you ever, before you ever begin. You know the most effective way to begin to share Jesus with somebody? is just to remember how many good things you have in Christ Jesus. How many good things Jesus did in your life. See, because then it's not a theological debate. It's just your story. Let me tell you where I was. How, how many of you heard Brother Osteen share his testimony? And he always starts with, I, I, I was uh, uh, driving home from the, working at the drive-in movie, or working at the movie theater, and I was lost and undone without God or His Son. And, and he cried out to the Lord and goes through the process. Talk about a ripple effect. Man. Not only through generations uh, uh, or, or thousands and thousands of people and, and in missions, but hear the impact. Now, now here's Joel still communicating the gospel in Lakewood and Miss Doty and all of that. Just think if he hadn't responded to, to the goodness of God. Look, it's easy to criticize, take pot shots at somebody. But when you take it back to that and you realize that it was God's goodness to a man who, who really didn't want anything to do with him, and Jesus just said, hey, I got a plan for you. God has a plan for you as well. And it's good. It's good and not bad. Breck shared this morning that verse from Psalm 100. And he's good to all generations. Come on, somebody. Some of you had a great grandma that didn't lead a church, didn't even host a church in her home, but she knew Jesus and she knew how to pray. One of you in this building had a great grandma that prayed for every generation of her kids. And went home to be with Jesus at 99 years old. And didn't see the fruit of that except your pastor who's standing here this morning. Thank God for the good things that he put in my life. And the times when we'd make fun of great granny because of her religious leanings. And didn't know that she was there praying in the spirit and praying with her understanding and praying us through some huge storms in our life and praying us through some bondages and some difficulties. But the prayers of grandmas kind of trump the prayers of the saints sometimes. Certainly the New Orleans saints. Hey now, all right. Every good thing we have in Christ. Y'all getting this this morning? Come on, say ripple effect. All right, here it is again. Here's another ripple. Verse 7. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Okay, here it is. The ripple comes. Paul said, man, your love has given me great joy. Not just because for me personally, but I see what it does. You've refreshed the hearts of the saints. Paul saw the ripple effects going out for generations and reaching thousands in their area and and their lives being touched. And he says, so so the ripple's coming back toward me as well. How many are grateful for sowing and reaping in the good good side of that, that equation? Amen? Then he gets into the meat. Here's why I'm really writing. Therefore, listen to this. Although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do 
what you ought to do. Yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus. Notice the first mention of Onesimus, the whole reason for him writing this note is not on the basis of, okay, I understand there's an issue here, there was a theft, there was there's some breaking of this relationship, I understand that Onesimus used to be under your employment. No, none of that. Because he's not setting up a case, he's just opening his heart. And what happened was, that Onesimus had some connection with Paul while Paul was under arrest for preaching the gospel, a prisoner. And Paul had led Onesimus to the Lord. Maybe Onesimus had committed another crime and was uh, imprisoned with Paul at the same time. Paul unjustly, Onesimus justly, nonetheless, here they were, and they made some connection, and Paul said, he became my son in the faith, while I was in chains or in prison. And so here is that aspect where Paul was active in sharing his faith, even in a difficult circumstance, and Onesimus responded. And so Paul said he didn't just become a convert, he became my son in the faith. Onesimus' name means useful. Useful. And so when we catch this up again in a couple of verses here and we see the ripple that, that Paul uses that term specifically that the one who was useless has become useful not only to you but to me on your behalf come on you see the ripple he was useless to you but now he's useful to me but he's also useful to you on your behalf and so we're all interconnected. We're all in the, the circle of influence and the ripple effect that's there. He said, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now has, he has become useful both to you and to me. He has become who he is. Basically that's what he's saying. He, he's begun to walk in his purpose of being useful. You ever had those seasons in your life where you look back and you think, does any of this matter? Am I making a difference? Am I being effective in anybody's life? That, that here, because of the difficulties of the relationship and decisions that had been made, he felt trapped. And he wasn't walking in his purpose. He was walking in the complete opposite direction. That's where repentance is so powerful because it means to turn around and go in the opposite direction. So here, Paul encounters Mr. Useless and he turns his life around 180 degrees. Not, not only spiritually, literally. And he said, you came to me running as a useless slave. Now, I'm turning you around with a note to Philemon, and I'm sending you right back to his house. That's change. That's the ripple effect. And so Paul here is bringing it all together, saying not only uh, uh, Onesimus's or Philemon's love has affected him, but, but he's turning this whole situation around, and now he's putting the focus on Onesimus, his son, that he's sending back. I'm sending him who's not just my son, but now Paul says, verse 12, who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me, so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a while 
was that you might have him back for good, no longer a slave, but better than a slave, a dear brother. Right? So here Paul is saying, not the fact that, look, the kid messed up, made a mistake, but, but he had a jailhouse conversion. And, you know, he kept swearing he, he, he didn't do anything wrong. Now I'm sending him back. Okay, now look, let's, let's look at this kind of a rehab thing. Look, just give him one more shot. Not that at all. He's saying, not only did he change, I, he's like a son to me. And, and not only that, look, he's my very heart. That, that I wish you could be here and minister to me while I'm in prison, but he took your place. Now you think how powerful that is. You ever been in a situation where you had the opportunity to confront somebody who had done, done you wrong and they were totally in the wrong? And yet somebody steps in, and it's not just the fact that they're taking sides with the issue, they bring it down to the real issue. Is this really worth it? How's this going to affect your heart? How's this going to affect your family? I mean, think, when Paul started this letter, he said what? Philemon, I'm writing this letter to you, but I'm also greeting your wife and your son. Your son, Archippus. Well, this is my son, Onesimus, who was formerly your slave, but now he's not. Now, I'm not asking you to take him back as a son. I'm asking you to receive him as a dear brother in the Lord, equal status in Christ. And that's a huge heart change. So Paul said, my heart's changed. His heart's changed. I need your heart to change. I'm not commanding you to do something legally. I'm not even requesting that you do something in the lines of authority. Nor is Paul saying that, you know, we just kind of sweep it under the rug. Oh, it's okay. You know, hey, no harm, no foul. He's a good old boy. That, that boy, you know, you remember when you were a kid? Did, did you ever do anything dumb? No, really. Not, none of that. The, the passion and the depth with which Paul writes is motivated by the Holy Spirit, but it's so deeply personal that he doesn't sit down and have someone else write the note. He writes it. And then he puts himself in this position of personal responsibility. Receive him back. The reason that you lost him for a little while, you know what he did? He ran away. He didn't lose him. <laughs> the kid took off. He, he was property. That's the hard truth of this deal. Onesimus was considered Philemon's property. And then when the property left, he stole money or destroyed something in the process because Paul now saying, look, if there's any monetary uh, uh, restitution to be made, let alone the fact the price you paid for him. I know that's blunt, but that's exactly what Paul was addressing. But he was addressing it from a spirit of love to where now we don't get stuck with the barriers and the, all the, the, the stigma and the emotion of it. Paul cuts through all of it by the Spirit of God and he brings it right back down to the heart. Because if your heart doesn't get fixed and your heart doesn't get healed and you don't receive him back in your heart, then he's always going to be a slave. He's going to be a slave to your opinion. He's going to be a slave to your label. He's going to be a slave to your unforgiveness. He's going to be a slave to your attitude. And so you can't do that. But in those words that are measured and, and bathed in love by the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul writes and he cuts through all of those things that would be huge and would hang over this deal like a thick fog or a black cloud. How many of you have ever been out on a lake or a pond early in the morning when the fog's rising up off the pond? It's a beautiful sight. 
But if there's ripples on that pond, you can't see them. The fog obscures it. But, but when it clears away, then sometimes it's just smooth as glass. And the slightest ripple goes the farthest. It's not the wind stirring the waters. So Paul's cutting through the winds, swirling around this issue. And he's putting the, the emphasis where it needs to be. In the heart of a young man who needs to be reconciled. In the heart of a leader in the church who hosts the church in his home. And cutting past wealth and the social status and the legal dynamics and all of that. And bringing it down to where life matters in our hearts. And out of the abundance of the heart, our mouths speak. Out of the abundance of our heart, decisions are made that not just affect our life, but create ripples for generations to come. And those ripples then come back to us. And what Paul's bringing here in the midst of it is a sense of peace where all of that can be so obvious and so real. So he says here, So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he's done any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Here it is. Not to mention that you owe me your very life. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Oh, and one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. What's it tell us? What, what, what about the ripples? What does it mean? If you looked at ripples on a pond, uh, it, it, you could determine after a while maybe where they came from, but not necessarily why. But I think here, God takes this little handwritten note and He preserves it as Scripture for us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, for three key reasons this morning. And those reasons are the main players in the note. I think Onesimus reminds us of something, and Philemon reminds us of something, and Paul reminds us of something. They're a picture. They show us. Not just by the ripples they were created in their life, but what they mean for us. And so let's finish with this this morning before we pray, can we? First of all, Onesimus shows me that every city has people that others have already given up on. Every city has people that others have already given up on. And some of them have given up on themselves. But with God, nothing is impossible. God has a a way of not just redeeming people, but restoring them. And when God restores them, and people are reconciled one to another, God's means of restoration means better than the original condition. That that God takes lives that are broken and separated and sometimes destroyed, messed up, and He moves powerfully in them and then restores them. Paul uses that term, that connection. He was formerly useless to you. I love the scene from Secondhand lions where the two old bachelors are out there and they're planting all the seeds and they think it's all kinds of different seeds and it's all corn. And, and Uncle Hub, you know, he's just frustrated. And, and, and so it's like corn, corn, corn. Everything's corn. And, and so his brother asked him, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid of getting old? And he said, no, I'm afraid of being useless. Great line. You should never be afraid of growing old. You, you, you should just grow old handsomely like me. Make that your goal. You, you should never be afraid of the future and the years and those kind of things, but you should always be afraid of being useless. And for Onesimus in particular, 
Not only had Philemon given up on him, how many other people had? I think Onesimus had probably given up on himself. Because it opened a door for Paul to share with him the good things God had done in his life. Remember? (laughs) I mean, if you're going to have a chance encounter as a runaway slave with somebody who's going to encourage you to go back and reconcile, how, how about the guy that used to persecute the church and now he's preaching the gospel that he used to try to destroy? You talk about mistakes. I've made a couple, son. There was a time in my life when I was useless. I was a bad Pharisee and I was a horrible Christian. That's a bad place to be if God's going to use you to write the Bible. Come on now. Three-fourths of the New Testament by Paul. The church had no use for him. He was trying to persecute it. He was trying to destroy it. The Pharisees didn't know what to do with him. He's just going bonkers with that. You know, it's just this whole thing. The law didn't work. The law didn't change him. But love did. So now he appeals to him in love and says, look, even if other people give up on you, you don't give up on them. God doesn't give up on you. That God can change people's lives. Listen, what does that mean for us? Think God's just handing us rocks this morning. Not as judgmental Pharisees, he who is without sin to cast the first stone. But to people who are so grateful for what God has done in their life. That our lives aren't built on shifting sand, but on the rock Christ Jesus. And he's getting us around the edge of a pond where we can just start chucking rocks in a pond and making ripples and making waves. And when we throw them all together, think what that could be. And in our city, I believe there are are Onesimuses, useless ones, who become that way because of mistakes. Some of those mistakes were made in the church. Some of those mistakes were made in the world and some were made with marriage. Some of those mistakes were made with alcohol. Some of those mistakes were made with their sexuality and choices. Some of those mistakes were made with children. Some of those mistakes were made at school. But they were obvious. They were public. And it rendered them useless. Onesimus, perfect example of that. Paul calls him. But he said, God can turn it around. And while Onesimus shows us that in every city there are people that others have already given up on, it also shows us, Paul shows us, that every city needs people who believe in the transforming power of the gospel. Not just religion, not just justice, but every city needs people who believe in the transforming power of the gospel. Listen, never forget... Uh, uh, several years ago, went to India, and uh, it was Elizabeth's first mission trip. She went with me, and we flew, and we got into uh, Mumbai, as they call it now, and got settled into our room, and our host called just a few minutes after that, and we were weary and jet-lagged and whatever, and, and asked if we would like to come to a service that night. They weren't imposing on our schedule. He was simply responding to a comment that I made as they were taking us to our hotel. And I looked over to my side and I saw this terrible slum that, that was basically just cardboard uh, uh, shacks and, and little shanties pieced together. And I asked him what that was because it was so obvious. And he said, that's the leper colony. And he said, that's where we began our ministry. And so we went on and, and made some comments and I asked about their, their ministry there. And so he said, since you were interested, would you like to come see it? And so I said, yes, I would. So that night we went, told you the story before that here we are sitting in this meeting. But you walk through the leper colony to get to their, their area where their church was. And it didn't look like the other buildings. And their people didn't look like all the other people. They were still disfigured, many of them missing fingers and, and faces disfigured, but there was light in their eyes. There were smiles on their faces, there was joy. And they began to worship, and in the midst of the worship, there was freedom and liberty and life. And then as we shared, then he asked if they would like to share. 
or if we would like to hear their testimonies. And I said, yes. And one lady stood and shared her testimony, and she pulled her scarf up with no fingers. She just had stubs for both hands. Her disease had eaten away her very limbs. And as she stood sharing her testimony of how God was using her and how God brought her out and was healing her from this leprosy, she was talking about healing in her heart, not healing in her hands. But yet the pastor spoke a message several years before that of how we can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And she said, even then, I thought, I'm not qualified for that. I don't have any hands. I I can't lay hands on the sick. I don't have any hands. Are you hearing me this morning? Every city has people that others have already given up on. And this is the lowest of the low. Their children aren't even allowed to go to the public school because they have leprosy. They live in a leper colony. They they don't have the disease, but they're still not allowed. They still live with the stigma. But here's a lady, as she shared her testimony, who's brought physical healing to several in their community because she went in their house and laid her stubs, her hands on them, by faith believing the word the pastor spoke to her. Yeah, there's people who others have given up on, but there are also people that, that are needed in every city who believe in the transforming power of the gospel. That God's Word works when we work God's Word. That that it's not just empty promises. They are the promise and the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. And it's not just the salvation and then waiting around for heaven. God's got something for us to do. God wants us to make waves and create ripples right there in our family and then pass that. This woman who stood to give that testimony in that leper colony shared later the power of her testimony was that she was married to an alcoholic that was so lost and demonized that he would beat her every night until he passed out. Every night night of her life and God said stay and pray and so then her pastor her husband became part of the pastoral team of that church as God totally transformed his life that's the transforming power of the gospel Onesimus shows us that there are people who think they're useless but we can reach them. Paul shows us that every city needs people who believe in the transforming power of the gospel. And then the last one is Philemon. He shows me that every city needs people who won't use their imperfections as an excuse for effective ministry. Paul didn't write and threaten him, brother, if you don't straighten up, we're not going to let you host the church at your house. Neither did he cower to him and say, we know you're wealthy. We know you're a real mover and shaker. Don't want to upset you here. We don't want to offend you. But you know, this is, this is kind of dicey. And, and Onesimus has really changed, so we want you to receive him back. Didn't say that. He appealed to him on the basis of love. Because when I read the Bible... For what it really is, not with my religious glasses on, what I see are people that God called and God uses that have some huge flaws. And those flaws bother us a lot more than they bothered God. Probably because God sees them through the blood of His Son, Jesus, who died to reconcile them and to heal them. Some of those flaws are obvious and some of them aren't. Some of those flaws are just deep-seated attitudes and prejudices. Some of those are hidden secrets. But God calls men and God uses men and women and God brings us together and God says, okay, here, I want to use you, the church, built on the rock and I want to take the rock and I want to drop it in the pond and I'm going to make some waves and I'm going to use some people who have given up even on themselves or other people have given up on Matthew Barnett said when he went to LA to build the dream center that 
he was sitting in a park seeing all this devastation around him and drug abuse going on and prostitution happening right in front of him. And he said, Lord, what about these people? And God said, if you'll reach the ones nobody wants, I'll bring the ones everybody wants. If you'll reach the ones nobody wants, I'll bring the ones everybody wants. See, in God's plan, people aren't a commodity. They're people. Worth the price of His Son's life. That God called with a purpose and God placed gifts within them. But if those gifts stay buried and dormant, we can never become all we're called to be. So what about you? I started to write, do this message differently. And uh, you remember back in the day when we were at the mercy of those uh, folks when they wrote the Scripture songs on the overhead projector? And sometimes you couldn't decipher the writing. I started to drag that out and go old school on y'all and, and just handwrite the note. The entire letter to Philemon. So I want you to do that in the overhead projector of your mind where are you in the story? You know, I've been Onesimus and I've been in the position of Paul and in some ways I've been in the position of Philemon and so have you. Some of you are just at the end. Philemon's wife and you feel kind of caught in the middle. Some of you are Philemon's son looking up to dad and saying, what are you going to do in this tough deal? They all saw when Onesimus came back and there was a knock at the door and he hands him a note not knowing what to say. Philemon unrolls it, begins to read, and he hears the heart of Paul. Listen. Listen. Receive him back as a dear brother. I'm sending my son, my heart, back to you. I'm appealing to you in love. Why? Because we need to affect this city. We need to touch people's lives. Onesimus is a representative of thousands more that are there. And you have an opportunity. Don't allow your imperfections to cause you to back off and to say, can't do it, not there, ain't happening. What about you? Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the grace that you bring into our life. I thank you for the words that you cause to flow through the quill on parchment hundreds of years ago. I thank you for change. Life change. And I thank you for the ripple effect that we're still experiencing today because of these obscure events back then. Father, I ask that you would work in our lives today and we would take those things that would work against us the waves of sorrow or discouragement or disappointment that the enemy is sending our way. Father, you said the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. That they wouldn't stop it. They wouldn't be able to hinder it as we walked with you. So Father, I pray this morning that we, we would be those that would take a stand here and not only speak up but make our appeal the same love that you do. I pray that as you touch our hearts this morning, Lord, that you would bring us together. You'd cause the ripple to, to cause us to flow together tightly. And then as we do react to that and respond to you, Lord God, that we would reach literally around the world with the life and the energy and the power of God that you release through us. Father, I thank you for it. I give you praise and glory this morning. 
I ask that as we respond to you in this prayer time right now, Lord, that you would meet us here in a powerful way. Drop the rock, Christ Jesus, back into the pond of our hearts. Start again the ripple effect. Or drop love in where judgment has been. Drop true forgiveness into our hearts where offense has ruled. Father, drop hope back in someone who feels useless and whose decisions have rendered them useless. But let the God who will fulfill His purpose for us cause the ripples to start again. Let them be more effective, more powerful than they ever could have been. Father, I pray that each one of us would just open our hearts to You and receive Your Word. Like that initial decision that Philemon had, how am I going to respond? He could have clenched his teeth and watered up the note. Could have called the law. Could have had Onesimus arrested, thrown off his property, thrown in jail. That wasn't the case. Because we still have the letter. They had a relationship. Onesimus went on to become the bishop of the church at Colossae. Father, I pray that you would release a fresh spirit of faith in someone's life today that feels like their purpose is finished and they feel like giving up, quitting. Lord, let this be Paul's appeal in love. Let this be the word of hope that brings faith. Let this be the turnaround the change. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Say, Pastor, that's me. I see myself. Maybe I'm the Onesimus, the one people have given up on, maybe I've given up on myself. But today I want it to be the turnaround. I want to start a ripple effect and I want to turn it the other way. Maybe you're a Paul the burden of this situation is causing you to want to say something, but you just want to do it right. Listen, make your appeal in love on the power of the gospel. You believe in the power of God to change. Maybe you're Philemon. You're wrestling with how to handle a wrong. And you feel right. But that doesn't make you reconciled. In a moment, 25 short verses, transformation happened. In a moment, change occurred. Right here, I believe God can do that. And if you do, by faith, just lift your hand and say, that's me. I see myself. I see the picture God was showing me. I see where I am. And I just want to respond to him. Come on, whatever it is. I touched on it. I spoke it. Maybe that's you. Maybe you wouldn't put it in those words, but you just want to respond to God. You feel God's presence. You feel His leading this morning. Several of you, others of you, just lift your hands. Come on, if that's you. Listen, change in repentance is a powerful thing. The transforming power of the gospel, the good news. If you raise your hand, just stand right there at your seat, would you? Come on, all over the room. That's it. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Just stand right there. Now, others of you, if you would, open your eyes and look around. If there's someone standing near you, would you just go to them? Come on, we're deputizing you on the prayer team this morning. Come on, our lives are connected. Let's create a ripple effect here. Let's let love begin to flow. Waves, Lord, of your forgiveness. Waves of mercy flow to somebody's life. Waves of healing at points of sorrow or disconnect, brokenness. Father, we just join together right now. What a powerful picture as we surround. It's like 
ripples and ripples of prayer and faith and belief. Lord, you said where two or three of us are gathered together, it, it, it creates waves of your love and power and life flow into those that need it. And so, Lord, we just take a moment right here to connect. We take a moment right here to release and to speak forth by faith our love, uh, uh, the, the word of the Lord, our prayers. Father, united together, and multiply the effect of that in people's lives. Let it bring true heart change. Father, let it be the point of courage to step forth and not only make things right, but to do the right thing for the right reasons as we're responding rightly to God in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, we thank you for it, that whatsoever we sow, that the prayer, the ripple effect comes back to us. Father, the faith that we put in somebody's life, we're going to need, but there's a wave of faith coming back toward us as well. Lord, the, the, the life and the hope that we're standing in, that we're praying forth into their life, comes back to us, that you've got resource for us. Lord, you bring it back to us, and we thank you for it. Father, I thank you that we don't go through it alone, that you connect us. We're not different parts separated. We're one body. And so, Lord, if one part suffers, we all suffer with it, but we release the healing just like our physical body does, releasing the white blood cells or releasing different aspects to bring and affect the healing of the life that you put in us. Father, in Jesus' name, heal hearts, heal souls, heal spirits in Jesus' name as you bring them back to the Holy Spirit, the one who makes us whole. God, we thank you for it. We give you praise and glory right now. We pray for new life to come forth in Christ, for reconciliation, Lord God, and true forgiveness that leaves no regret. Father, I thank you that we don't have to live in remorse, looking back at our mistakes when we choose repentance. Not only can we face a situation, God, you can redeem it. You can make it something you use for your glory. We thank you for it this morning, Lord, for genuine ministry, for life, for receiving your word, and then responding, acting on it. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Glory to God. Come on, can we rejoice in the Lord this morning? His goodness. Hallelujah. Hey, be seated for just a moment. One more thing I want to mention to you. Uh, actually, two things, but one is in the way of announcement. Night at 5 o'clock, we're going to have a meeting here at the back of the sanctuary. We have several folks coming. And here's the plan for this series. Uh, next week, next Sunday night, we're going to launch a whole new uh, a group of small groups, meetings, all around our area. And, and it's based just on this. I just feel like God wants us to drop some rocks into some ponds. God wants us to make some waves. God wants us to release some ripples of love and prayer and life. And here, as uh, Philemon hosted the church in his house, the scripture says every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and from house to house. That they didn't separate themselves by house meetings and house churches, but it was another opportunity for people to connect. I believe there are people in this city that others have already given up on. And I believe we can make a difference in drawing them back in. I believe that there are many people in this city that need to have a genuine demonstration of the transforming power of the gospel. Not another religion, not another church, not another fight with whoever. God help us. Grace, love, acceptance, mercy, and live it out in the life that God's called us to live in. And so you might not be in a position or feel uh, that, that you, you can lead a group. Uh, remember Philemon? Don't let your imperfections disqualify you from ministry. Don't let it be an excuse. Maybe it's a season right now where you can't, but you can host a group. You can connect with somebody else. Partner with them and say, hey, I don't feel comfortable leading this necessarily, but I'll, I'll open my home and 
we, we can have some people in, in our area. And I want us to begin to target people specifically in our community that you're already connected with as our Onesimus. Okay? Somebody that's blown it. Somebody that's made a mistake. Somebody that's in an awkward place. And let's, let's reach out to them. Let's begin to pray for them. And then let's watch the transforming power of the gospel work in their lives. And let's don't just go to church. I appreciate that you come to church. But my heart, my heart is that we be the church. And so as you go through those doors, I want you to determine to be the church. And as you go through the front doors this morning, I want you to step onto the mission field. And I want you to see it just like that. And I want you to be David. And I want you to have a pocket full of rocks. And I want us to go face some giants. In the name of the Lord our God. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's make waves. And, and, and I also want us to say how proud I am of our young people and uh, the passion and the enthusiasm. And I think they just earned the place of permanent greetership. And uh, <laughs> amen. Hallelujah. So, so we're going to have a, a time... We'll work in here over the next several weeks where we can hear testimonies and stuff. I know some of you parents are excited to, to hear what all's going on. And, and I'm just blessed that they got back real early this morning, but they all stayed awake and they stayed focused and they made a difference. That's a, the example of the ripple effect, don't you think? Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Stand together. Everybody put one hand up. Turn to somebody near you, high five, start a ripple effect.